Hello, today we're going to be covering pregnancy related complications and I've mixed in a little of our selected health conditions. Um, so we'll, if you're following along in the um, Reiki Kyle book, we'll be looking at chapter 19 and a little bit of chapter 20 has been um, added. So when we're talking about pregnancy complications, we're looking at um, conditions that would result in uh, what we'd call a high-risk pregnancy. And we start this risk assessment with the first prenatal visit. So we're looking at, at conditions that would cause jeopardy to both mother, fetus, or, or to either mother, fetus, or both. And sometimes these conditions are already present or the result of the actual pregnancy. And all of these conditions that we'll be discussing today um, will increase our morbidity and mortality rates in both our moms and our fetuses. So some of the conditions that cause at-risk pregnancies um, would be diabetes, diabetes before pregnancy, or even gestational diabetes, which is just during pregnancy. Any cardiac problem or respiratory disorder that the mother might have is going to be exacerbated when um, she becomes pregnant. If she has existing anemia, that pregnancy, um, the, the pregnancy-induced anemia, or um, the anemia that is caused by the excess blood volume that we discussed in a previous lecture will be increased and there'll be more issues. And anemia can be pretty serious if it's um, low enough because we do have our added bleeding risk and we have our reduced oxygen carrying capacity. Autoimmune disorders um, will definitely increase our uh, pregnancy risk, and then some specific in uh, infections, and we will go over those a little bit later in the lecture. Our vulnerable populations, um, and, and just to point out, this was um, a photoshopped photo from a uh, news magazine a while back, but it's just making a point. Um, but our vul vulnerable populations are adolescents. And they are still growing themselves, and so being pregnant actually um, uh, affects their ability to continue their own development. Women over 35 are at higher risk for lots of the conditions that we'll be talking about. Um, even though we see women in their mid 40s, late 40s, early 50s uh, becoming pregnant now, we consider over 35 advanced maternal age, and over 40 is now considered a geriatric pregnancy. And then obese women that, that are obese before they become pregnant uh, have much higher risk of, of many of the conditions that we'll be discussing now and in future lectures. Um, HIV infections definitely make our babies and our moms more vulnerable during pregnancy and women who are using substances. We'll talk more about that in, a, in an additional lecture when we talk uh, about our newborns. So some of the pregnancy complications that we're going to be covering, we're, we're going to be looking at hyperemesis gravidarum. We're going to look at bleeding during pregnancy, both early and late pregnancy. Um, we will discuss gestational hypertension and help, but I'm actually going to save that for another lecture. Gestational diabetes will be discussed, blood incompatibility, amniotic fluid imbalances, multiple gestation, and our premature rupture of membranes. So hyperemesis gravidarum is a severe form of nausea vomiting. As I mentioned previously, we do see um, increased nausea and vomiting in the first trimester of pregnancy. It's very common as those hormone shifts are starting to happen. But if, we're t if it's moving into hyperemesis gravidarum, these are women that it, it continues on past that third month. And... Um, uh, we hope that it resolves by about the 20th week, but if it does not, we will have to help them. And some women have such a rough time during pregnancy, they end up um, having nutrition through a PICC line and or being hospitalized for their entire pregnancy. So um, there can be uh, more than a 5% weight loss of the pre-pregnancy body weight. And our big issue is um, we're concerned about dehydration and metabolic acidosis and alkalosis and hypokalemia. So if our moms are starting to have some um, imbalances with their electrolytes, it actually can become life-threatening. So we need to watch these mothers very closely. 
So we want to uh, have some very conservative diet, uh, looking at very bland foods, eating small meals throughout the day, trying to keep down as much um, nutrition as they possibly can, watching the hydration status very closely. There are medications that can be used, but in the recent years, there have been some um, evidence that maybe these medications could be contributing to some specific birth defects. We have to use them cautiously. Uh, Reglin is one and Zofran is another that we need to um, make sure that the benefit of using them is definitely outweighing any potential risk. And then, like I said, they may have to be hospitalized on a PICC line. And so those um, students that are planning on going into med surge or ER, you will definitely see women with this condition coming into your areas, um, pregnant women. And now we're gonna move into some of the bleeding disorders of early pregnancy. Um, we will talk about spontaneous abortion, ectopic pregnancy, our trophoblastic disease, and cervical insufficiency. I wanna point out here that when I use the term abortion, this is a pregnancy that um, ends before the 20th week. And in layman's terms, we use the term abortion um, to describe the therapeutic abortion most often, which is the abortion that a woman chooses to have, but it's, it can, it is considered any pregnancy that does not continue. So miscarriage, the layman's term for pregnancy that doesn't continue, that was a wanted pregnancy, um, sometimes those are interchangeable. I don't ever use the term abortion with my patients because um, to describe a miscarriage because they have one idea about that word. So we just use the word miscarriage when we're talking to our patients. So when we are talking about um, spontaneous abortion or miscarriage, usually the cause is unknown and there's many, many, many contributing factors to that. Sometimes it's genetic abnormalities and we may or may not know those things. Um, if it's a second trimester, it's more likely related to some sort of maternal condition. And we'll talk more about that as we um, go along. Our nursing assessment is any sort of vaginal bleeding needs to be um, looked at. And one of the questions that NCLEX really loves to ask is, um, when is sex not uh, okay in pregnancy? And it's if there's been any vaginal bleeding, it needs to be assessed by the provider before sexual activity continues. Cramping and contractions are another sign of spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. We're going to be watching those vital signs very closely pain level, and then the client's understanding of, of the potential. So if we have a woman that comes in with vaginal bleeding and cramping to the ER, she's most likely going to be cared for there rather than going to um, a, a maternity floor because we typically don't see those patients until they start to reach the edge of viability, which is somewhere um, 20th week is usually the um, standard. So you will see pregnant patients in other areas of nursing um, other than OB. Vaginal bleeding, again, is something that we need to be watching very closely. And those cramping and contractions will feel different in a smaller gestation um, pregnancy than they will a, uh, a larger gestation. So it may feel like a backache that's coming and going, or it may feel like a period cramp. It won't feel the same as if it were, um, if, if the uterus was large with a full-term pregnancy or almost full-term pregnancy. So there are some terms to describe um, spontaneous abortion. We have threatened, we have inevitable, incomplete, complete, missed, and habitual. So threatened is um, we see some cramping, some bleeding, it's, it's a potential. Inevitable is when the bleeding is so heavy that it's not possible for that pregnancy to continue or there's um, no longer a heartbeat for the fetus. Um, incomplete is um, where part of the products of conception have come out, but not all of them. And we have to help the rest of those come out either with medication and or a surgical procedure. Complete is when everything has come out on its own. Um, a missed abortion is when, again, we have a fetus that has um, perished for some reason and has not come out completely and habitual is more than three times. And 
um, this is someone usually that has a, a genetic problem or possibly something else going on in the uterus that's keeping her from being able to stay pregnant. Here are some pictures of uh, the conditions I just uh, described. So incomplete, inevitable, we have a, a membrane rupture and the cervix starts to dilate and then um, threatened is when we start having a little bit of bleeding. Now, sometimes there can be some bleeding early in pregnancy and that pregnancy can continue on as normal. So all vaginal bleeding doesn't automatically mean that the, the miscarriage is going to happen. It, um, it's just a sign that we need to be on the lookout and do some more assessment. And then I always start with a picture that is, um, uh, like an illustration and then I will move to a live picture. So I forgot to mention at the beginning of this video, most of my videos are not suitable for young children. And so this is your um, warning. If there are young children, it probably is not a good idea for them to continue watching this video. So these are some pictures of some very early um, miscarriages that have happened. Typically these babies are our fetuses are born in the um, amniotic sac. That's not uncommon. Sometimes they come out intact. Um, and then again, we will be watching for that placenta. If the, everything does not come out, if all of the products of conception do not um, come out on their own, we have to help. And when you're describing a DNC, dilation and curatage is what that stands for. This is where the cervix would be uh, manually dilated using um, a dilation tool and curatage um, is using a sharp curved knife to remove the um, remaining products of conception that have implanted into the uterus. And then sometimes um, they will use a suction uh, device to remove the products of conception that are inside the uterus. Um, both of these methods are also used for therapeutic abortions. Those are the abortions um, that our women have, cho have chosen to have. Um, and this is typically the method for that early trimester abortion. So our nursing management, we need to be watching very closely our vaginal bleeding. We can have hemorrhages um, after our um, uh, uh, spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. So a pad count or weighing more likely, um, nowadays we weigh all the bleeding. We wanna make sure all the products of conception have have come out. So we'll be watching very closely for the placenta. And then um, providing medications. Sometimes there'll be some antibiotics involved. Sometimes we will use medication to help the rest of the products of conception to be removed. One of those medications would be uh, misoprostol or Cytotec, and that causes strong uterine, uterine contractions. Or um, Oxytocin, which is a synthetic, uh, pitocin, which is the synthetic form of oxytocin that causes uterine contraction. So both of those could be used. Now we're going to be moving on to our ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that is um, a fertilized ovum that implants anywhere outside of the uterus. And it can happen lots of places. You can actually have a fertilized ovum anywhere in this fallopian tube. It can happen outside the uterus. Um, again, this picture shows that the ovary and the fallopian tube are touching, but they actually are not. So it's possible for this egg to be released from the ovary and then be outside of the tube. It can, this um, fertilized ovum can set up outside um, on the uterus in the peritoneal area. It can be in the cervix. It can be lots of places. It can even be abdominal. Um, in the abdominal cavity. So if that happens, this pregnancy cannot continue. The life of the mother is at risk and it cannot continue. And so again, um, uh, some pictures are coming up that are um, live. So this is an example of um, a ectopic pregnancy that was in the tube. And then this is what it actually looks like. This is the tube and this is the ectopic pregnancy that has started to develop there. And if this were to continue, this will rupture the tube and there will be free form bleeding in the 
um, peritoneal area in the body and a woman can actually bleed to death. So this is why I say this pregnancy cannot continue. And as of the time of this recording, they are not able to successfully implant these um, uh, fetuses anywhere else. So if we have an ectopic pregnancy, a, a fertilized ovum that has uh, an, an embryo that is growing outside of that uterus, it, that pregnancy cannot continue. That, it, that is a true situation where the mother's life is at risk and um, it will have to be removed in order for the mother to survive. So signs of this is abdominal pain possibly with spotting, sometimes no spotting, and it's within six to eight weeks after a missed period. So those of you working in the ER, once again, we will be paying very close attention. Someone hasn't had a period for a couple of months, has a positive pregnancy test, comes in with severe abdominal pain, right-sided, left-sided. Um, we are going to be looking for ectopic pregnancy, and typically they will use an ultrasound to try to determine where that um, pregnancy is. If the tube, the fallopian tube, if it's in the tube and it is not in danger of rupturing at that moment, sometimes they will use a medication called methotrexate, which is an um, anti-neoplastic medication that causes the fetus to stop development and to die and um, it can be reabsorbed by the body. But if that tube is in any danger of rupturing, then surgery will have to be performed. Here's an important note. If this mother is um, has an RH negative blood, if, she, if her um, RH factor is negative, we need to give her Rogam because we do not know what the blood type of the fetus was. And so it's okay to give someone Rogam um, even if they didn't need it. So they will need a dose of Rogam after any spontaneous abortion or miscarriage, um, therapeutic abortion or ectopic pregnancy. If she's RH negative, she needs a dose of Rogam so that the um, potential of creating um, antibodies is not there. We, we can help to avoid that potential. And here is another picture of a uh, tube that is in danger of rupturing and this is the ectopic pregnancy that was removed from that tube. Now I'm moving on to gestational trophoblastic disease. Um, this exact cause is really unknown. Um, what we do know is it, that this is a um, basically a blighted ovum or a, or a, a a fertilization that has happened, but there's no nucleus. So there's no baby there, but the body thinks that the woman is pregnant. So there are a couple of types. There could be a complete or a partial, but there's no genetic material. And it can progress into a choriocarcinoma. So they do recommend after this is removed that we do not um, uh, get pregnant again for at least a year. They want to let that that tissue heal and make sure that there is, are, is no um, um, cancerous material that is developing. So the, the problem with this is we see um, these women thought they were pregnant and typically they'll go in for one of their um, scans or, or prenatal appointments and their body will be acting like they're pregnant but then there's no heartbeat found and then they'll investigate a little bit further and um, determine that it's a uh, trophoblastic disease. So they do need immediate evacuation of the uterine contents. They'll do a DNC and again we want to um, avoid pregnancy if at all possible for at least a year. Cervical insufficiency, also known as incompetent cervix, is the premature dilation of, cervix, of the cervix. Um, we don't know exactly what causes it, but we do think that there's a potential that it could be from cervical damage. So if someone has had many um, abortions where she's had dilation and curatage, that, that manual dilation of the cervix, it could potentially cause damage to the tissue. Or if there's been um, cone biopsies or any um, removal of that tissue for testing purposes, there are some certain medications that were given to um, women previously, DES being one of them, that caused cervical insufficiency in their daughters, which is very interesting. Um, 
if we know of cervical insufficiency, if it's something that a woman is already aware of, they can do a procedure called the cervical cerclage very early on to help close up that cervix and it will have to be removed before the baby comes. Um, they usually take it out somewhere 36, 37 weeks. Therapeutically, they need bed rest, pelvic rest, meaning no sex, and avoidance of heavy lifting. So women with cervical insufficiency and or cervical cerclage will be on bed rest for their entire pregnancy. And that can be very tiresome to women to be on bed rest for that long, especially if they have other children that they need to care for. So when I'm talking about an incompetent cervix, we're talking about a cervix that starts to open um, as the baby, the fetus starts to put pressure there. So um, we see it starts to shorten first and then it opens too soon. It usually opens, um, the pressure of the baby is usually so great at around somewhere 18, 19, 20 weeks that it will cause that cervix to open and then labor progresses and the baby's born. Unfortunately, that is not viability. So 18, 19, 20 weeks, um, these babies will not survive. The earliest time, earliest, this is up for debate, but usually we start to talk about peri viability, which is just in the very beginning stages of it, somewhere between 23 and 24 weeks. So if a woman knows that she has an incompetent cervix, they will typically do a cerclage somewhere 12 to 15 weeks to try to catch that window. Unfortunately, most women are not diagnosed with incompetent cervix until they've had the first um, pregnancy that doesn't continue. And um, um, there, there's usually a loss that goes along with that. So in order to diagnose um, uh, incompetent cervix that you have to do a, a transvaginal ultrasound, there's a probe that's specifically made for this, that will go and look at that cervix and look at the thickness of it, see if it's thinning, see if it is um, shortening and starting to dilate. So a transvaginal ultrasound is the um, best method of determining if there's an incompetent cervix. And here's that cerclage I was talking about. It's called a purse string stitch. So you're looking straight on at the cervix at this point. And a physician, it's under general anesthesia, a physician will tie the edges of the cervix together and put a knot here. So when it comes time, that's gonna close that cervix and keep that baby inside. If this cervix has already opened too much, they're not able to do this. And, um, and they have to be very careful not to rupture the membranes when they are doing this procedure. Um, cervical cerclage has been around for a long time and it's actually very effective if, if, it is, if it happens soon enough to continue the current pregnancy. These are a couple of pictures are the, of our little babies. These are, this baby is probably somewhere between 18, 19 weeks. Unfortunately, they do not survive at this time. They do not have the capacity to live outside of the mother. If this happens, um, we are going to support this mother through this delivery. We do lots of mementos and keepsakes for these babies, um, footprints, handprints, pictures. There are, um, gifts that have been made and donated by certain groups. All hospitals all over have this sort of thing, usually little crocheted blankets and sometimes little gowns that are made out of um, donated wedding dresses, that sort of thing. Um, so again, we are going to help this mother through this process. And um, we, this is when we will be using some of our other disciplines, chaplain services if she desires, social services is usually involved. Um, uh, you know, we, I feel like in, in this area of labor and delivery, this is the part that most people don't talk about, but um, it, it is, I would say fairly common, not, not frequent, but fairly common. We, every labor and delivery nurse will have this experience at some point. Um, so again, we just try to support them through this process as best as we can, because this is still their child and it is still their um, it, it, delivery. These are some of those mementos that I was talking about. And I wanna point out here, this falling leaf is kind of a universal sign. Some hospitals use other signs, but we have these little door tags that have this falling leaf. And it's, it's a way of letting everyone in the hospital know that um, 
what has happened behind these doors are not happy. So uh, we always make sure that dietary, lab, radiology, anyone that'll be coming into the room understands what the falling leaf means. And it usually means that there's been a loss in that room, whether it be a preterm loss or even a neonatal loss. Um, uh, this is a, an easy, easy way for us to know what that means. And as I said, some other hospitals have chosen some other themes, but the falling leaf is kind of a universal theme. <clears throat> okay, moving on to some conditions, um, uh, some late bleeding conditions, placenta previa and placenta abruption or abrupt abruptio placenta. You will see these terms used a lot. NCLEX loves these terms. Um, they have some really specific um, diagnostic factors. So they love to put questions about um, placenta previa and placenta abruption in your test questions. So placenta previa, we don't exactly know why it happens in some pregnancies and not in others, but this is where the placenta actually implants over the cervical opening. Um, that's called the cervical os. So depending on when this is diagnosed um, is going to depend on what kind of therapeutic management we do. We want to, um, we usually know somewhere in that second trimester that this is happening because women will come in with a large amount of blood loss or they will have had their, their 20 week ultrasound and they'll notice that the placenta is down low. We are going to be watching for signs of labor. They need to be on bed rest. They need to um, definitely have um, no vaginal exams. They will have uh, uh, pelvic rest, so no sexual until the after the baby is born. Um, the cardinal sign of placenta previa is painless, bright red vaginal bleeding in the second or third trimester. So painless, bright red vaginal bleeding is a cardinal sign of placenta previa. Here's a picture. This is what a normal um, placenta looks like. We'd like it to be up here if it if if we could re, you know request it. Up here is the is the best place in that um, upper third of the uterus. Here is a low lying placenta, meaning the placenta is attached to the wall of the uterus, very close to the cervical os. And as this baby starts to put pressure, we might see some bleeding. Low lying placentas can move up enough as the um, uterus grows uh, for that baby to be born vaginally, um, but they need to be watched very closely. And here we have a um, comp complete placenta previa, and you can see that this baby is not going to be able to come out through the cervical os um, because this placenta is blocking that area. And we cannot risk the placenta coming off the wall of the uterus um, with contractions. So this will be an automatic cesarean section. Here is another picture, um, nice placenta up in the top, normal placenta, and then here's that placenta previa. So placenta previa is the placenta that sets up uh, covering that, that um, cervical os. And yet another picture you can see. This baby, the placenta cannot come before the baby because remember, this is where all the nutrients, gas exchange, blood exchange, everything the baby needs is coming through the placenta. And until it can come out of the body and circulate oxygen through its own lungs, it is not possible for um, the placenta not to be functioning. So placenta abruption is when that placenta comes off the wall of the uterus and the baby is still in inside the mother. So it's separation of the placenta leading to compromised fetal blood supply, but also compromised um, uh, blood supply to the mother because she is still pumping blood into that area and it um, she can hemorrhage from a placental abruption. So our therapeutic management is assessment, if we can, and control of the bleeding. Sometimes we'll have what's called a partial abruption, or it will be an evolving abruption. And um, we are trying to help save the mother and the baby before we get to uh, being hemodynamically unstable. 
Of course, we're going to think about restoration of blood loss for both mother and baby, because both are going to be losing blood volume, and prevention of DIC. DIC is the condition that would um, that sometimes can happen if we've had a great blood loss and um, disseminating intravascular coagulation is what DIC stands for. And that's something that we'll talk about as um, we talk about other sections, but we are trying to prevent that from happening with our um, placenta abruption. So here's a progression. You can see that we're starting to have just a little bit of a placental abruption here. And then as it gets greater, 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 if that, placenta is not on that wall of that uterus anymore and not attached, then it's not able to um, do perform the gas exchange and um, oxygen exchange for that baby and eventually the baby will perish. So one of the signs of placental abruption is how the baby's responding on the fetal monitor. We're going to talk more about that next week when we talk about labor, but this is um, one of the reasons that we are watching that fetal monitor very closely. So if we suspect mom has a placental abruption or if she has some conditions like hypertension that contribute to the potential of um, uh, abruption, then that would be um, a just cause for her to have continuous fetal monitoring. We talk a lot about evidence-based practice and using intermittent fetal monitoring for women that are low risk, but right now we are talking about high risk women that do need us to watch continuously. So our cardinal signs of abruption are dark red bleeding, knife-like pain or uterine tenderness or rigid uterus, fetal movement and activity will be decreased, our fetal heart rate might be changing, and we would be looking at things like um, our CBC to see if our h and is dropping. We'd be looking at our fibrinogen levels, our bleeding times, our PT, PTT. We want to type and cross match these mothers and have blood available for them if they have an abruption going. And then we have um, our non-stress test and our biophysical profile, which is a way to tell how our baby is doing on the inside. So this is a classic pattern, and I know we haven't talked about um, fetal monitoring much yet, but there are other videos that cover that, and we will be talking about it in, in um, uh, next week's lecture. And so as you see these contractions, I'll just very quickly explain, we are looking at uterine contractions here. And if we're having more than five contractions in, in a 10 minute time span, we call that uterine tachycystole. And that is one of the signs of uh, abruption. Because what happens is, it, as a uh, placenta comes off the wall of the uterus, the body says, okay, we have to clamp this uter uterus down because it knows that um, there's going to be excessive bleeding. But if the fetus is still inside, it can't do that. So it will try, it will attempt to clamp that uterus down. And so that's where you see this tachycystole. And you can see here, this is the baby here, um, doesn't have a lot of variability in this and starts to have these late decelerations and then they're becoming more frequent, more frequent, more frequent. Eventually these late decelerations are going to turn into um, a decrease in the fetal heart rate and eventual fetal death. So this is one of those signs that we would be looking for. If I were walking by a bank of monitors and I saw this on the floor, I would run to the room and try to determine, is the mom having a rigid abdomen? Is, is she having knife-like pain? Are her vital signs changing? As this bleeding continues to happen, her vital signs are going to start to change. You're going to see the pulse rate go up, and then eventually you will see blood pressure go down. Respiratory rate will probably go up because these are healthy women that are trying to compensate. So this is when you need your bedside assessment. And here's another picture of a placental abruption that's happening. You see that uterine tachycystole here. Here are those late decelerations I talked about and eventual um, issue. I, I hope this is not, this is a, a picture of a fetal monitor that I found. This is not a specific patient that I've cared for, um, but I hope that at this point they were running to the OR and um, helping to save this mom and this baby. So abruption management, we're looking for tissue perfusion, oxygen, uh, 10 liters by a face mask, 
Left lateral position gives the um, best oxygen flow to that baby. Strict bed rest. Vital signs, watching that fundal height. If the fundal height is rising, we're worried that it's because there's bleeding. And again, continuous fetal monitoring. And I'm going to just quickly discuss the hypertensive disorders that can happen, but we're going to talk about them um, at length in our high-risk delivery section. So gestational hypertension is hypertension that happens after, after the 20th week. It can move into a condition called preeclampsia. If that condition continues, it can move into a condition called eclampsia, where we start to have seizures. We also have a condition of chronic hypertension, which is where there was hypertension in the woman before she got pregnant. And then there's this little beauty called, that is called chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia. And again, we're gonna discuss this at length. I just wanna throw these terms out here now because I know they're mentioned in this chapter and you may see them on some of your course point quizzes, um, but we will discuss them at length as we continue on. Now, moving a little bit into some of those conditions that are um, uh, can affect our pregnancies, the, this is a little bit from chapter 20, we're going to be talking about diabetes, and there are a couple of different kinds. Type 1 is a, a, what we used to call juvenile diabetes, but type 1 is um, something that you will have your whole life. Type 2 is actually... Uh, acquired throughout your life. And we used to see type 2 in obese adults, but now we actually see type 2 diabetes in some obese children. And then we have something called impaired fasting glucose or pre-diabetes and gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is during pregnancy, and that's the one we're really going to focus on here. And um, we can call it pregestational and gestational during pregnancy. They will be doing a glucose tolerance test to help determine if there's um, diabetes going on in the pregnancy. And I'm just going to spend a minute here discussing what diabetes is. This is very simplistic. I'm sure in some of your other courses, med surge, um, anatomy, physiology, you will have discussed this at length. But just to remind you, when we're talking about diabetes, we're talking about how our body uses glucose. So we're going to say that um, glucose is our children and everybody needs glucose. We want glucose. Our brain wants glucose. Everybody's happy with glucose. But uh, glucose really needs to be inside the cell. And so we're going to call that our house. So this is my little analogy. Here are the kids. They're, this is our glucose. And they're out here playing in the yard, playing in the street, but they really need to get into the house. And the only way they can get into the house, which is the cell, is to have the right key. And that's insulin. Insulin is what allows glucose to get into the cell and do what it's supposed to do, do its chores. So when you have diabetes, if you have type 1 diabetes, you don't have enough keys. There aren't enough keys to get all the glucose into the cell. When you have type 2 diabetes, your keys don't fit the lock anymore. They just aren't um, working well. When you have gestational diabetes, it's like having type 2, but it goes away after you no longer have the additional stress of the pregnancy. Now, if you have gestational diabetes, you have a 40% chance of converting to type 2 later in life. So we are watching those women very closely. So again, a very simplified term, but we need the insulin to open the key to the house to allow the children, which are the glucose, to get into the cell, which is the house, my simplified version. So again, type 1, no keys. Type 2, not enough keys or they're sticky. They don't work very well. Um, uh, impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance pre, that means those keys are starting not to work. And gestational, there's not enough keys or they don't fit the lock temporarily. <clears throat> so if we have diabetes, we definitely need some preconception counseling. They need to look at the A1C. Um, uh, sometimes they call it a, a hemoglobin A1C or an HA1C. And it, the, it, we want good control before pregnancy, so less than seven. When they're looking at an A1C, they're actually looking at that uh, blood glucose molecule that hangs around 
um, I'm sorry, the, the looking at the hemoglobin, which is what attaches to the glucose, and it hangs around for up to three months. So you can look back to the last 90 days and really know how well controlled the um, glucose has been and or how, how well controlled the diabetes has been. So we're looking for less than 7%. Nutritional management, this is key. This is so important in, in um, pregnancy. If we have someone that has diabetes, they must be controlling their um, nutrition appropriately. Looking at some hypoglycemic agents, looking at sometimes women are on metformin, um, sometimes women are on other um, hypoglycemic agents that are helping to control their blood sugar. They need very close maternal and fetal surveillance and then management during labor and birth. So the problem with diabetes in pregnancy is not so much the mom, but the baby. If mom has gestational diabetes that she is not controlling her blood sugars well and or not taking insulin to control those blood sugars, then the baby's body starts to produce insulin in response to all this high blood sugar because the baby doesn't have diabetes the baby's all the baby's keys are working so as the blood sugar is coming through the placenta and being introduced to the baby the baby's body says oh we have to produce insulin a lot more insulin to um, help these keys open these locks and get this blood sugar out of here Blood sugar out in the cell acts like glass and rips up the cell, rips up the tissue and causes damage over time. For these babies that are producing large amounts of insulin, we see they grow very large. Here's an example. This is a normal weight baby. This is a, just a, a baby of a diabetic mother who was not well controlled. And you see they have these broad shoulders and they set up these um, um, the fat tissue uh, very greatly because uh, insulin acts as a growth hormone. So we will screen these women at 24 to 28 weeks, anyone that I think everyone's screened nowadays, everyone's considered at risk. And then we're going to be watching them very closely. We're going to be watching her urine for protein, for ketones, for nitrates, for leukocytes. Um, again, we're also going to be evaluating um, if she's spilling any sugar in her urine. We're going to look, uh, do an eye exam in the first trimester to see how well um, her sugars have been controlled. We'll be looking at an A1C every four to six weeks. With our babies, we're going to be doing an ultrasound, looking at um, weight gain, watching those alpha fetoprotein levels that are done early on. Biophysical profiles will be done um, in the third trimester sometimes as often as every week to make sure that these babies are doing okay and our non-stress test. What happens is we see um, groups of uh, birth defects that go along with gestational diabetes. We see cardiac anomalies. Again, I already talked about the growth and that can affect our delivery, being able to get these babies out vaginally. They can um, have issues. And then once they're born and that cord is cut, we have to watch their blood sugars very closely because their bodies are still producing the insulin. Insulin is still being pumped, 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 but yet they don't have that high blood sugar. So it leads to hypoglycemia in the newborn period. And we cannot let our babies not have enough blood glucose get into their brain. So here's a picture of a baby. Um, this mother had obviously very uncontrolled gestational diabetes probably upwards of 13 pounds at birth. Um, these babies don't eat well. They um, don't have good muscle tone. They don't breathe well. They have high blood, um, uh, high insulin production, and that causes hypoglycemia, and they're not eating well, so they can't take in enough nutrition to counteract it. They end up on IV fluid. It takes time. We know babies that are born um, under these conditions have a very high chance of, of having diabetes later in life as well. I think if we did better education with our moms on how important it is to maintain that glycemic control, that's really what we're looking for in, in gestational diabetes or pregnant women that have any other form of diabetes, if we really educated them that it's the baby that's going to suffer, I think we would have better compliance with our diet control. Because diabetes is one of those conditions that you don't see the effects of until later in life. So women think, 
a hamburger's no big deal. I really want it. Uh, I really like to go get some ice cream right now. I'm really craving these things. I'm wanting that sugar. And um, it's our babies that suffer. Okay, moving on into anemia of pregnancy. Again, we've talked about this before. Um, when you, before you were pregnant, you um, have hopefully are in a normal um, red blood cell range. And then when you have more blood volume, you don't have as many red blood cells. And so we call that anemia of pregnancy. So here's a very good example. Um, this is uh, first trimester or right before you become pregnant. Um, RBCs and plasma are about equal. Third trimester, you have a lot more plasma but not as many RBCs. And so um, it causes physiologic anemia of pregnancy. We expect that. One of the um, issues we see is if they were already anemic before they became pregnant, it usually is inadequate dietary intake. And so we wanna help them by giving, making sure that they're taking supplements. A lot of women do not like to take their iron supplements because um, it causes um, constipation or in some cases even diarrhea for women. Um, what we'll see with these women is they're very fatigued. They may be very pale and have pale mucous membranes. They might have some tachycardia. They'll definitely have some low lab results. And so we want to try to help them um, get to an adequate level before they have their baby because if they're already deficient before they have their baby and then have the blood loss after their delivery, they are going to have um, all of these symptoms will be increased. So the best way to increase food, uh, iron is from food. That's the way that we absorb it the best, looking at our leafy green vegetables, nuts, whole grains, dried fruit, organ meats. I know a lot of people don't eat organ meats anymore, but um, chia seeds, all these are uh, ways of increasing the iron. So it needs to come from whole foods, um, not highly processed foods. I'm going to discuss our maternal fetal blood incompatibility just a little bit. I touched on this earlier on in um, today's lecture, but I just want to talk about this for a second. We have, um, when we're talking about um, blood, you have something called an ABO incompatibility. So just to remind everyone, all we, we have four different types of blood types. You either are A, B, AB, or O. Those are the four different types of blood that we can have. And on that, we are either have a positive or a negative RH factor. So you're either A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative, O positive, O negative, or AB positive, AB negative. If the mother has a different blood type than the baby, there's a potential for something called an incompatibility. And what this incompatibility means is the mother's body recognizes the baby's blood type as being foreign, just like it would any other foreign substance, and it will start to build antibodies to it. If those antibodies are produced, it will start to cause breakdown in the baby's body. And if the baby has an excess amount of red blood cells to break down, it increases the bilirubin, which causes a condition called jaundice. Now we're gonna talk a lot more about jaundice later, but these are the, the issues that we see. So we can have something called an ABO incompatibility. This is when mother has an O and baby has an A or a B. And um, that can be an incompatibility. Or we can have something called an RH incompatibility, where mother is negative and baby is positive. What will happen is if there's a mixing of those blood types, mom's body will start to produce antibodies. And it won't be this baby that's affected. It'll be the next pregnancy and the next pregnancy and the next pregnancy. So this is why if a woman has an abortion or a miscarriage or an ectopic pregnancy, or, um, we need to, and she has an RH negative blood type, we need to give her Rogam, which is the um, medication that we would that present prevents them from developing antibodies. So if a mom is Rh negative, she'll get Rogam at 28 weeks gestation because we don't know what the baby is. So all Rh negative women will get Rogam at 28 weeks, and then again within 72 hours, if the baby indeed was 
uh, had a positive blood type. So we, this is why it's so important early on to get good prenatal care so that we can look at a mother's blood type and determine if she is RH positive or negative and give that <clears throat> uh, rogam if needed. I'm moving on into some of the disorders that we see with our amniotic fluid. And so amniotic fluid of more than 2000 mLs is called uh, polyhydrominos. And we typically will see this in the third trimester. Um, if you have more than 2000 mLs in the second trimester, uh, we're, we're very concerned um, because that, that uterus is very large. So we're going to be watching very closely um, the fluid. We also are going to watch very closely the um, when the water breaks uh, for a couple of different reasons, and I'll discuss that in just a minute. So uh, some of our therapeutic management when we have polyhydrominose is um, there's some medication we can give. We can give endomethacin, which decreases the fluid by decreasing the fetal urinary output, but there's some specific guidelines of when that can be given. Um, and different providers are, are following those guidelines. Uh, we don't want to give it after 32 weeks. And then um, our nursing assessment is looking at that fundal height. This is a good indicator of polyhydrominose. If, if that fundal height is not matching approximately the week's gestation, then we know. Women will dis um, complain of extreme abdominal discomfort. Sometimes they will uh, not be able to breathe very well because their bellies are so large. Uh, it'll be very difficult to do Leopold's and feel where that baby is inside that uterus. And sometimes it's very hard to even um, hear fetal heart tones with our monitoring systems if she has severe polyhydrominos. Um, so ongoing assessment, very important. One of the things that we're concerned about with poly is when if that water breaks, it and that baby's not engaged, it's still floating around in all that fluid, we can have a condition uh, called prolapsed cord. And we will talk about that more next week when we um, talk, or in the next two weeks when we talk about complications. But we are very concerned if this water breaks spontaneously. So sometimes polyhydrominos can be caused by uh, anomaly in the baby, sometimes upper GI obstruction or atresia, which is uh, narrowing. Sometimes neural tube defects will cause poly, abdominal wall defects, impaired swallowing. So we see some, our conditions, trisomy 13 or 18. Diabetes, 18% will have polyhydrominose. And idiopathic, meaning we don't know exactly what causes it. Um, so this is a really great NCLEX question. They like to know the causes of poly. And um, yeah, so that's information you want to know. Oligo is not enough amniotic fluid. So oligo is less than 500 mLs between 32 and 36 weeks. And one of the ways they determine how much amniotic fluid is inside is they do something called an AFI, amniotic fluid index, when they're doing the ultrasound. And they're looking for pockets of fluid that, and then they do a mathematic, mathematical computation to determine the AFI. And you will see that when we're doing our biophysical profile, one of the measurements is AFI. So um, again, therapeutic management for oligo is um, serial monitoring, possibly an amnio infusion. If the membranes have already ruptured, that's where we put fluid back in. We'll discuss that well, um, next week when we discuss some of the um, procedures that we do. Uh, we're looking for risk factors. Is she leaking fluid from the vagina? What's going on? And this, an oligo, uh, because there's potential for cord compression, we are going to be watching very closely um, uh, our babies. So these are babies that need continuous fetal monitoring. So some of our causes here, the number one cause for oligo is uteroplacental insufficiency. And what that means is the placenta is not giving the baby what it needs anymore. And so we will see decreased amniotic fluid when our placenta is not working very well. So if our babies are post-term, this is one of the things we're looking for. And this is why amniotic fluid index, AFI, is used in, um, is part of our biophysical profile. Premature rupture of membranes can cause oligo. Hypertension in pregnancy can cause oligo. Maternal diabetes can cause oligo. So it can either be too much or, or too little. Um, 
inner uterine growth restriction, our baby's not getting what it needs from the placenta for whatever reason, it can be um, the cause for oligo. And again, our post-term pregnancy, there's a natural decline in the last few weeks. And sometimes our baby might have a kidney issue. And so we're going to be looking for kidneys, um, making sure that they're there and functioning after birth. So making sure they're there, we would do by ultrasound and functioning is looking for that first um, urine output. Premature rupture of membranes. Uh, when we are discussing this, this is when the water breaks. Um, before, it, this is beyond 37 weeks. Uh, so after 37 weeks, when they're officially considered a term pregnancy and their water breaks before they go into labor, we consider that premature rupture of membranes. And sometimes women can be ruptured for a long time. We obviously are watching for signs of infection. It's very, very important that we watch for signs of infection because we now have broken that barrier that is keeping um, the bacteria from getting to the mother. We call it prolonged premature rupture of membranes for women that are less than 37 weeks. Spontaneous rupture of membranes, if it breaks on its own, we call that a SHRAM. You'll see that on some of your SBAR um, reports. AROM, artificial rupture of membranes, means that we did it artificially. We used a tool, used the, usually called an amni hook, to do a, um, a rupture of membranes. And the treatment, it depends on the gestational age, it depends on where she is in her labor process, and it depends on, on how far along the baby, uh, like I said, the gestational age. So if the baby's lungs are immature, we might give the baby some, or uh, might give the mother a steroid injection, either dexamethasone or betamethasone, to help encourage the development of surfactant which is going to help the lung development and because we expect that delivery is imminent. So depending on the age is going to depend on the um, treatment. If she is um, term, we might actually give her medication to help labor start uh, to decrease the risk of infection. So the nursing assessment is, um, we're gonna be looking for signs and symptoms of labor. We're going to be watching that fetal heart rate on the monitor. We're going to be looking for the characteristics of that fluid. Um, taco, taco is our time, amount, color, and odor. Very important, these are the assessment criteria that we're going to be using. So if your water breaks, you have to think about tacos, time, amount, color, odor. We're going to be taking the woman's temperature per policy. It's usually every couple of hours and um, doing CBCs per policy uh, at least every day uh, if she's um, premature and we're trying to keep her pregnant for a little while and let those baby's lungs mature. We're going to be watching CBCs for sci early signs of infection, watching the, um, looking to see if those white blood cells are increasing. Some of the ways that we can determine if a woman is, uh, has ruptured membranes you see nitrazine paper talked a lot about on NCLEX, so I'm going to mention it here, but nobody really uses nitrazine paper anymore. It's really an old way. Nitrazine paper is just a pH paper. It's just a little piece of pH paper that you touch to the fluid, and it will either turn bright blue if it is um, amniotic fluid or bright yellow if it's urine or some other sort of fluid. Um, and again, it's just testing pH. It's not very accurate, and they don't use it very much. Fern testing is an old method of taking a, a sample of the amniotic fluid, placing it on a slide, and looking at it under a microscope. It has, when it dries, it has a very distinctive fern-like pattern, um, kind of looks like fern fronds. Um, again, this is a very old way. We don't see these tests used very often. Uh, the more modern ways are looking at AmniSure or ROM Plus. These are both um, tools that are looking for specific proteins that are only found in amniotic fluid. And it looks a lot like a pregnancy test. You place some of the fluid or a swab from the vagina into a solution, and then you drop that solution um, onto a little uh, pad, and the pad will either turn plus or minus, or you'll see two lines or one line, and it will tell you whether it's amniotic fluid. And then doing serial amniotic fluid indexes is another way of knowing if um, a woman is ruptured. This is a little bit um, hard to do. It has to happen over a couple of days, and that amniotic fluid does fluctuate a little bit, so it, it's not 
definitive, but it's one of the tools that we see some of the providers are using to help determine if the amniotic fluid is rising or if it's falling significantly. And now moving on to uh, multiple, multiple gestation. This is when you have more than one baby in more than one fetus in the uterus. And I don't know if you can point this out here, but this is one picture of one baby. And here's the face of another baby. Um, so when we have more than one baby in the uterus, everything is considered high risk because you have more cords and more arms and more placentas and there's just more of everything. Um, so they need very close monitoring during pregnancy. There's a condition called the twin to twin transfusion where the placenta sometimes um, allows one baby to get more of the nutrients and oxygen than the other and we can see very um, big discrepancies in their weight so we're going to be watching that very closely. Typically multiple gestations come earlier than um, term babies because the uterus gets larger uh, at a faster rate uh, and during labor and delivery um, we are going to be watching them very closely to make sure that there isn't compression on one baby's cord. Um, some babies, some twins are born vaginally. It depends on the unit, depends on the um, area, depends on uh, the providers that um, are taking care of these patients. Many twin deliveries, even though they're vaginal, will happen in an operating room because there's always the potential for a cord prolapse or an abruption or something to happen with the second baby and they want to be able to give that baby Baby is much of an opportunity for a good outcome as the first baby. So um, rushing back to the OR in that situation is, is not always a good scenario. So we're going to be watching um, again for hemorrhage. Uh, these, these moms are at higher risk for everything, basically. They're at higher risk for hemorrhage. They're at higher risk for gestational diabetes, um, higher risk for hypertension, more than one baby at a time puts a lot of stress on the mother's um, body. There are a couple of different ways that babies can be in the uterus. They can be monochorionic and monoamniotic. That means that they're in one sac and have one placenta. This is the type that is the um, most dangerous because it's very easy for this baby to reach over and grab this baby's cord. Uh, there can be entanglement happening, one placenta supporting both fetuses. Um, that can, th most of these babies are taken surgically uh, at a fairly early gestation, sometimes as much as 33, 34 weeks. And then you have babies that are uh, monochorionic and diamniotic, so they're in two different sacs, both sharing the same um, placenta. Here we have dichorionic and diamniotic. There's a fused placenta, and then we have di, um, uh, dichorionic and diamniotic with separate placentas. So there's lots of different ways. I'm not asking you to know all of those um, terms. I just wanted you to know that twins doesn't just mean twins. We also have fraternal versus identical. Fraternal twins are two eggs and two sperm that were just uh, present at the same time and that fertilized in the same uterus. Those are our babies that are um, uh, just basically siblings sharing the uterus. And then we have our identicals, which is one egg and one sperm that split very early on. So they are genetically the same. And that is our identical twin. Here's triplets. You can see how this uterus gets very um, crowded very quickly. And uh, triplets are almost always born by cesarean section. I think there are some videos out there of triplets being born um, vaginally. I personally have never seen it. That's not something that happens in my geographical region, but I suppose anything is possible. And here's just a couple of pictures of these babies sharing a uterus and um, they are very close uh, afterwards because they're used to having each other uh, the entire time. So you'll see that as you separate them into cribs once they're born, sometimes they um, protest and want to know where their sibling is. I hope you found today's lesson useful. If you have any questions, you know where to reach me.